I want to quickly introduce our host for today, Jason Schoenholtz from Trident Management, one of the wonderful management companies out there. We love working with them. Uh, very reputable. Jason, please take it away and uh, take it from here. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm Jason Schoenholtz. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Trident Management. We're a uh, nine-year-old company based here in South Florida, handling your portfolio and on-site uh, management needs. Um, we are one of, we're actually one of the few uh, AAMC accredited uh, associate, uh, association management companies in the country. So that's our, our latest uh, accolade that we're very proud of. Uh, with that, I'll give it over to Emily so that she can uh, take the course. Cool. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jeff. All right, guys, I'm Emily Gannon from K Bender Rembaum. To give you a quick little summary of us, uh, all we do is association work. We're, I think we're 21 attorneys now. Uh, our main office is in Pompano Beach. And we had a little freeze up. Uh, while we wait for Emily to come back, our main office is in Pompano Beach. We have another in Palm Beach Gardens. A new location over in Winter Springs, which is servicing the uh, Orlando, Central Florida area, and also over in Tampa. We could also meet you in, in offices in Miami, Dade County. That is by appointment. Now, even with those physical office locations, we can service the entire state of Florida. Those are just our physical locations that we mentioned. You can check us out over at kbrlegal.com. And I'm going to turn it over to Jason just for another moment here, just so I can check in, uh, check on Emily to see what's happening. Oh, looks like we're okay. back. Hi, guys. I, I don't know what's going on. I got Emily, well, technology is wonderful when it works. And I finished off the uh, okay. office locations and now we can serve the entire state. So Great. we got through that and it's back to you. All right. Then we'll we'll jump in. If, if some. Ah. Uh, it's going to be like that. <laughs> We can create a lot of memes with this one. So um, so hang on. Uh, we're going to, Emily, if you can hear me, why don't you go on out and, and log back in and see if that does the trick. And in the meantime, I'll get the slides ready. I'll do the sharing just to play it safe here. Jason, what, what else is going on in the industry uh, with Trident Management? Anything you want to uh, let... Uh, folks about you may have some clients here you may have some potential potential new clients what's happening uh let's see what we can talk about trident uh as i said we're a uh, here comes out of here. yeah can you hear me i don't yeah, know yeah we going. can hear you i don't know what i don't know what's happening here it's being difficult with you yeah like i said jeff you have the outline so if i get booted <laughs> Yeah, I'm, can, I'm gonna I'm pulling it up now. Call in and we can we can go through it. Uh, yeah. If yeah. for some yeah, I've reason got it, I've got it ready if you freeze up. Okay. So all right. Let's let's see if we can do this here. Well, hi guys, Emily Gannon from K Bender, one of the partners. I've been here 12 years. Uh all we do, like I said, is association work. Let's jump in and, and get started. So we're doing updating your docs today. It is why it's critically important. Now, uh, you may be aware if you've read the news, if you hear what's going on in in, in sort of this world, a lot of changes in the statutes uh, this year, the last couple of years. Um, I, I almost uh, miss those days where we used to do legal updates and there was not much to do and we would just sort of have to kill two hours talking about a couple little things they tweaked here and there. Last couple of years, not the same. There's a lot going on. So we need you to be aware of that, but that corresponds to updating your docs and what's in your documents now. So let's get into that. We're not really going to get into the new changes, but again, it's it's related. So I want you guys to just be aware. All right. Hierarchy of your governing documents. This is sort of a basic 101 here of what are we talking about when you hear us say docs, documents, governing docs, what are we even talking about? A lot of people just use the term bylaws, but that's that's not sort of all encompassing. So be aware there are different governing documents that serve different purposes and that do different things. And one is, you know, may control over another if there's a conflict. When we're talking about a condominium, we're talking about your declaration of condominium. Your declaration is sort of your constitution is what we always say. 
That's the agreement that everyone has in place that usually outlines all of your restrictions. Uh, you know, that's where all your promises are made. The association is going to provide you X and you're going to provide Y in exchange. Uh, things like that. Then we have your articles of incorporation. That's just what sets you up with the state. What you file with sort of sunbiz.org, if you're familiar, that's how you're a, a, an active entity. You have to file your articles. Bylaws. Now, the bylaws, again, are their own documents. So when I hear a lot of, you know, just sort of board members say, we need to change our bylaws, we need to change our bylaws. They're usually using that term to mean all of their governing documents, but the bylaws are a specific set of documents or document that really outlines all of your 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 government type things. So how many board members you're going to have, how your your meetings, when your meetings are going to be held, that sort of thing. Then we have rules, regulations, any standards, ARC forms or ARC guidelines, things like that. Those are sort of the bottom of the, the tier here. In the world of HOAs, very similar structure, but it's set of declaration of condominium. Usually it's called the declaration of covenants and restrictions or declaration of covenants and easements and restrictions. Sometimes you hear people refer to that as your CCRs, uh, conditions, covenants and restrictions, whatever. Some variation of those words usually. Then you have your articles, then you have your bylaws, then you have your rules and regulations and, and your ARC guidelines. So easiest way to remember that if there's a conflict and we have to figure out what what controls is that old school uh, commercial or I guess advertisement that used to be around that was a little dab will do ya. So think of dab, declaration, articles, bylaws. If there is something that conflicts in those documents, that's the hierarchy. Declaration is on top, then your articles, then your bylaws. And there's also a question about what statutes we're talking about when we're talking about governing documents, talking about association work. Florida statutes, we have a couple different chapters to, to consider. When we're talking about condominiums, usually we're talking about chapter 718, that's the Condominium Act. When you hear people say Condominium Act, it's chapter 718. Co-ops are 719. I don't know if we have anyone here from a co-op, but uh, co-ops are important too. We love you guys too. You're just not as um, as prevalent as the other, the other two. Um, for co-ops, side note, your governing documents are a little different. It's, a, it's sort of a whole different world, but also not that different, oddly enough. So your documents are different. You don't have declaration in the same way. What you're going to have is you're going to have a proprietary lease and you're going to have bylaws. And again, that's where your restrictions are going to be. That's where uh, you're going to find any, any important information. Proprietary lease, bylaws, as opposed to a declaration. Chapter 720 is what we talk about for HOAs. And then also 617, that's the Florida not-for-profit statute. That sometimes comes into play. It can sort of fill in the gaps, so to speak. If there's something that um, is not covered by 718 or by 720, we can fall back and see if it's covered by 617. Generally, that's um, that has to do with certain, again, sort of uh, operational things for associations and boards. But typically 718 or 720, would again control over 617 if we're talking about something that's a condo in 718 or an HOA in 720 uh, question. There's also a question about, again, which one would control the statute or our governing documents. And we're going to get into that a little bit more later on, but it's a whole argument and a whole legal discussion, and it can be very complicated. And so if there's any question, and again, especially with some of the newer changes, this is something that's going to be really important and is, is you know, sort of a hot topic in, in our field at this point in time. There is a question of whether the statute's going to control or whether your covenants control and all of that. And that has to do with whether or not something to the, a change to the statute is procedural or substantive. That's something you need to talk to your attorneys about. Again, could be a more complicated question than it sounds. And, uh, you know, we get that all the time. Hey, our documents say this, but the statute says this. Which one do we follow? And I wish we had a nice, easy, simple, clear-cut answer for you, but we don't because it's a number of factors and a couple of things that you're, you'd probably have to talk to your, your counsel about. Easiest example, when we talk about changes to the statute that are procedural, that will most likely, that are going to apply to your, your association, despite what's in your governing documents, 
is something like the condo uh, election process. When they put that into 718 and they put that into the admin code, everyone in the world of condominiums now follows that procedure. So the two, two notices, the two envelopes, all of that, that is all the way that elections are run for condominiums. And that was a change to the statute. That may not have been what your document said if you were in a condominium because that was a procedural change. So again, it gets a little complicated. It can get a little messy, but that's the neatest example I can give you. All right, so let's get into what's the amendment process. So keep in mind a couple things to just be aware of. There's case law that basically says to challenge an amendment, you have a five-year statute of limitations. So that's important to note because sometimes we have some owners who say, I don't like a certain amendment or I don't think it was adopted properly or whatever it may be, and they want to challenge it. And if you're, if it's been in place, which really for our purposes means having been properly adopted, but then also having been recorded because it's not effective until it's recorded, guys. So you can't just say, hey, we took a vote and now this is our new procedure. It's we took a vote and now we're recording it. And now it's in the public record of Broward County or Miami-Dade or Palm Beach or wherever. Now it's effective once it's recorded. And then you got you should send it out, obviously, and notify everybody. But it's five years from that date if somebody wants to challenge it. Now, different ways to go about the amendment process. The first thing I'm going to tell you, then this is sort of the biggest takeaway from today. My number one tip for anyone here, anyone who came today, if you're thinking about updating your governing documents, number one thing I'm going to tell you is what is your amendment threshold right now? Look at that. Look at your governing documents. Now, if there's nothing, the statute says it's a two-thirds vote, but typically your governing documents already say something. There's probably some language in there. There's probably a whole article on amendments. And to amend your declaration, it might require X percentage, 75% of the owners. But your bylaws maybe are only two thirds of the owners, or maybe your bylaws even say a vote of just the board. Could be totally different. So you wanna look at each governing document that we're talking about, and you want to make sure you know the amendment process or the amendment threshold for each one of those. And it may be something you're only amending in your declaration, and you don't have to worry about your bylaws or vice versa. If you're amending your declaration, and you have a super high threshold, you have, you know, 75%. And we get this question all the time, and I think we already got one preemptively for today's uh, seminar. What do we do when our owners are just not involved? We can't get the vote. What are we supposed to do? Couple different things. And, and I, I don't really have a good answer for you, and I'm sorry about that in advance, but you got to get your owners involved. If you think you can get, you know, an amendment in place that's going to ultimately save them money, or you know, protect your property values, something that you know the board thinks is important, but you gotta remember, you gotta get your owners on board too. If it's something that you think you know you can really kind of get them, get them, you know, hyped up for, so to speak, then get some committee members, get the word out, have some town halls, have some board meetings, really get some attention on it and let everyone know here's what we want to do. We want to adopt some amendments, here's why, here's how we think it benefits you. But to do that we know we have to lower our threshold because we're never gonna get you know, these votes. Now, if you can lower your threshold, the problem is you need that initial vote just to do that. So if your vote is 75% or your requirement is 75% of your owners, you're gonna need 75% of your owners to approve reducing that before we even get into any, any substantive other amendments. Now, we will always tell you, look at that first, because I don't wanna spend hours drafting amendments and putting all this great stuff in that we think could really help you if realistically you're never going to get it passed. So start there. Start with what your voting threshold is. See if you can reduce it. Usually you can get your owners sort of, it's palatable to get them down to maybe a majority because again, then, okay, majority of the members are going to approve the future amendment. That's usually a, an easy sell. If you could get it even lower, even better, maybe you could do something where it's a majority of those who vote at a meeting at which quorum is obtained. So now you only need to get quorum and then you need a majority of those to vote in favor in order to get an amendment to pass. And there's really no limit here. It's really up to the board and how they wanna present it and if you can get it passed. But again, if you have that high threshold to begin with, 
I, I understand you're going to have a challenge. I completely understand. And it's really just sort of good old fashioned getting boots on the ground. And if anything, maybe you want to see if your owners would consider electronic voting. That's another way to get more participation, potentially. Um, that's something that's really become popular really ever since COVID. It was around before then, but since COVID, it's it was it's huge now. There are a lot of platforms. It's pretty economical, I believe. And uh, that may be another way to get your you get your owners involved. So that's my number one tip to you. And also I know everyone's number one complaint is we can't get our owners involved. We can't get anything, you know, what do we do? We can't get participation. How do we get any amendments passed? And, and I know, and that's all I can really tell you. You got to just sort of try, 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 and, and try and get some attention on it. And first step, reduce that voting threshold. Don't waste your time drafting a whole bunch of amendments yet until you can get that down to a number you think you can reach. All right. So you can do this. You can do a lot of these amendments at a meeting. Obviously, generally, that's how it works. But you may be able to do it by a written approval process where you do a mail out instead. And you just get consent. Proxy voting, obviously, that's another way to get some more attention on it. You can have your meetings, have the owners vote by proxy so they don't actually have to be there in person. Great. Um, that gives you time too. those proxies are good for 90 days from the date of that original meeting. So you could continue the meeting and have sort of a part two if you don't get enough votes or a part three. As long as those proxies you know, are within that 90 day window, they don't expire. You can keep gathering more. You can keep getting you know, more and more uh, votes. You want to look at your leasing restrictions. That's a hot topic right now, too. There's two sections that are that now sort of weigh in on this specifically. They almost create a statutory grandfathering. There is one in 718, there's one in 720. They have different language. They were, uh, my understanding is they were very tempted to make them basically mirror each other. The one in 718 has been around for a while now. 720 was just modified. I keep saying just like it was yesterday, but it was 2021. I've lost all sense of time in the last couple of years. It was 2021 that they put that restriction in. And basically now, like I said, it's almost a statutory grandfathering. If you're going to put in a lease restriction, that is going to limit leasing or limit the terms of leases, things like that. If an owner doesn't vote in favor of it, it's not going to apply to that owner. It would only apply to owners who take title after or those who vote in favor. Now, again, it's sort of a statutory grandfathering. I understand people want to put some lease restrictions in and typically they want to do it to impact those who already own in the community and who are already leasing. But again, you got to look at sort of whether or not that that makes sense and whether that would work for you guys. There are some, they don't exactly, like I said, sync up. So there are some changes depending on what kind of restriction you're putting in. In 720 for HOAs, they did indicate that there are some exceptions that if it's something, if it's short-term rentals, things like that, you're trying to prohibit. There are ways where it may apply to everybody, but be aware those are other important considerations for you. Suspension of voting rights, that's another thing to consider when we're talking about trying to get an amendment passed, because again, you want people to be able to vote, you want people to participate, you want them to come to meetings. If you're suspending voting rights, potentially that could affect the numbers we need, or that could affect, and, and that could be good or bad. Usually if someone is, is delinquent, you're suspending their voting rights, they probably wouldn't have participated anyway. Um, but again, that changes your, your calculations a little bit, so you want to make sure you really pay attention to those things. Mortgagee approval, that's an important factor as well. Sometimes there's language in your governing documents that specifically says if you are amending a certain section or you are making an amendment that could negatively impact a lender, for example, then they need to be able to approve it or it's not going to, it, it, or it doesn't fly basically, or it doesn't apply to them. So there's a process in the statute, again, for both condos and HOAs, where you get that mortgagee approval. And it sounds silly. How am I going to get you know, Bank of America to agree to this amendment we want to put in place? That's why the statute put this in. It's actually sort of a negative notice. You send them out, you know, you send out the notice saying, hey, we're going to do this amendment. If we don't hear from you, basically, we're assuming you've consented. And then there you go. They can't come back years later and say, hey, we didn't approve of that. And now we have an issue with it. But that's an important consideration. If you're doing anything that's going to affect a lender's interest, potentially, you know, a foreclosure related uh, amendment could could apply to them. All right. 
So these are sort of our basics. Now we'll get into some of these sort of hot topics, so to speak. All right. So, and the way we did this, we put true or false because we could do a little fun interactive thing, but now it's just me talking to a screen. So it's not really interactive. You guys just have to bear with me. The big thing here is supposed to really focus on what provisions do you have that are illegal? What provisions are costing you money? We don't want you to have language in your deck or language in any of your governing documents that could potentially subject you to fair housing claims, discrimination claims, even if you are not. Clearly, you have no intention of discriminating. There was That was not a thought that ever crossed your minds. You may have language in your governing documents that someone could challenge and say, wait a minute, they're discriminating. Look at this language they have. And without even realizing it, now you're, you're dealing with a claim. You're, maybe your insurance gets involved or maybe you have to have your attorneys respond. And even if you're successful, even if you win the claim, even if there was you know nothing to it, you've spent all this money, you've incurred all these attorney's fees to defend yourselves. So it might be easier to just remove that language and make sure you avoid that situation altogether. All right. First little topic here. Foreclosing lender is required to pay 1% of the original mortgage debt for 12 months of delinquent assessments. True or false? False. Now, it sounds true. And there's a reason for that. And that's intentional. Um, because that is essentially the language that's in safe harbor. You've probably heard that term a bunch of times. Even if you're you're not too involved in your foreclosures, or maybe you don't even have that many foreclosures, you've probably heard the term safe harbor a number of times. Essentially, safe harbor means that the lender gets a certain benefit, a certain protection that's already in the statute so that if a first lender forecloses and takes title, even if that same owner, if Mr. Smith was running up a balance and hadn't paid the association in a million years, and the lender comes in and they foreclose on that mortgage that they had on Mr. Smith's unit or Mr. Smith's house, um, potentially now you can't just say, hey, Bank of America, you owe us all that Mr. Smith owed us because he hasn't paid us in, in a bunch of years. Not how it's going to work. Bank of America is going to tell you, no, we don't. We got certain privileges. We get certain protections in the statute, in the law. Now, typically safe harbor is the lesser of 1% of the mortgage or 12 months of delinquent assessments. Now, the complication here is your governing documents may actually have language that is worse than that, that limits your recovery even more, that basically says, no, Bank of America owes nothing of the back amounts. Bank of America only has to pay from when they took title going forward. And all of those amounts that Mr. Smith incurred, out the window, completely wiped out, gone. You don't even get your lesser of the 1% or 12 months. And that's entirely up to, again, what your governing documents say. So you really want to look at that. That's one where you just want to, again, it's easy enough. It's simple enough for your attorney to fix for you if there's a problem. And again, your owners are probably going to agree to it because why would they have any objection to it? But that's an easy enough assessment where you just don't leave money on the table, so to speak. So you want to take a look, see what your governing documents say. If you've had any bank foreclosures and your attorney has basically told you, okay, now, you know, account, zero out the account and start fresh, that may be because of the language that's in your governing documents. And again, maybe you want to modify it and follow what's actually in the statute so that you get the benefit at least, and it's not great, I know, but at least safe harbor is something. So those back amounts don't get completely wiped out. Emily, banks have really caught on to this. I know, I know they, you know, we used to, in the industry, we used to get away with it more and more, but these days they're taking, it's worth their five minutes of time to go look at your governing documents and come back to you and say, no, I'm sorry, I'm not entitled. You're not entitled to that. And we're oh, going to yes. work away happy. And yeah. you're not going to be happy. So like she said, that's an easy fix. Yeah, you're right. No, Jason, you're right. I mean, it used to be when this sort of argument started, so to speak, most of the banks didn't care. You just you told them, OK, safe harbor and they'd pay it. No question. Wouldn't wouldn't take the time, like you said. Now they have a little more time on their hands. We're not quite in the, you know, big heyday that we were in a couple of years ago. They're um, yeah, they're willing to take a take a minute, take a look and then tell you, no, nope, not paying you that. I'm only paying you, you know, going forward. 
So easy fix for you guys. And again, why leave money on the table, right? All right. All new owners must go through the screening process in our community. Again, false. That's not in the statute anywhere. That's not in 718, 719, or 720. It might be in your governing documents. Hopefully, should be, probably, most likely, running the odds, probably in your governing documents. But you want to make sure you have the authority that you think you have and that you want to have. Lots of boards will tell you, yep, we screen everybody. We screen all, you know, prospective sales. We screen all prospective leases, all transfers, all, you know, guests that are there over X number of days. Well, you have to make sure you actually have the authority to do that, or you're going to have some very unhappy people pushing back and saying, you don't get to screen X, Y, and Z, or you denied my application wrongfully because you didn't have the authority to review, to pull a background check. We've uh, we've seen lawsuits on that kind of thing. Background checks that weren't authorized, um, you know, f denied sales that, again, no authority to deny. And those can be huge lawsuits because, again, think about it. They're, we're talking about significant damage when we're talking about denying a sale. If someone can't sell their property and now they have to wait six months and now the price has gone down and they take a huge hit and that's because of something the association did, there's pretty significant damages potentially at play. So you want to make sure before you just say, oh, well, that's what everyone does. So that's what we're going to do. And that's what we've always done. Make sure that authority is actually in your governing documents. To really deny a sale, to reject a sale. Again, selling a piece of property is a, is a you know, something we value very highly. If you have the ability as the association, as the board to stop that, that language and that authority really needs to be in your in your declaration, in your governing documents, and it has to be written in a certain way. It has to have a right of first refusal built into it. And we won't we won't get into it too much. Again, we teach a we have a whole one hour class just on screening and and sales and all of that. But the right of first refusal is an important phrase that you guys should know. Essentially, it means that if your governing documents give you the authority to reject a sale, you have to also have accompanying that the right of first refusal, which means, okay, we can reject this and our seller is not going to be damaged because we can insert basically a substitute purchaser, which could be the association or could be some other party that the board finds, some investor or whatever it is. Now, there are exceptions. If you're going to deny a sale and not exercise your right of first refusal, you have to, again, have that authority to do it, and it has to be really for good cause. You're denying it because the purchaser has, you know, again, terrible credit or a serious, uh, you know, um, criminal background, and you don't want that person in your community. But those are not slam dunk reasons either. You have to make sure you have the authority to have that criteria. We would tell you to actually put good cause criteria, specify the good cause criteria in your governing documents, let an attorney draft it for you, because again, we want to be really careful how we're wording everything. When we're talking about criminal history, that is a hot topic. That is something that if it's not phrased properly or if it's not done properly, again, you could be on the wrong side of a discrimination claim. They've done studies that, you know, if your policy is essentially any criminal history means we're denying, you're going to probably be on the wrong side of a discrimination claim. That's not going to cut it because They've done studies where the impact of that type of policy has a discriminatory effect. Even though you don't mean to be obviously discriminating against anybody, it has a discriminatory effect or a discriminatory impact on, and it's a disproportionate impact on certain groups of, of people, certain protected classes. So we have to be very careful with those types of things. And we want to make sure that, again, you're not walking yourselves accidentally into a discrimination claim. Um, so that's very important. Criminal history, we want to make sure we're looking at, you know, again, we're phrasing it the right way and we're putting that in our governing documents and we're not just pulling it out of the air as our, you know, policy. You want to make sure, again, that it actually covers all of the different types of transfers. If the authorities in your governing documents to review sales, does that also mean inheritances, gifts, quick claim deeds? Does that cover everything? Or does your documents, do your documents actually specify sales and all other transfers? 
Sounds silly, but we've had some pushback on those things too. Because again, you know, lawyers, we like to actually look at details and words and things like that. And you might have a lawyer on the other side who, who says, wait a minute, this is actually a transfer or this is a quick claim deed or this is an inheritance. You don't get to review that, that type of a transfer. Your documents don't say anything about it. Well, they could be right. So make sure your governing documents actually cover every possible scenario for every type of transfer that you want to be able to review. And you may have your reasons for having certain exceptions, by the way. And I'm not saying you can't. We have communities where they allow exceptions for, you know, intrafamily uh, devices or, or gifts or things like that. And maybe that's a 55 and over community and they want to, you know, allow an owner to, to leave it to their adult child and not have to screen them. But we've also run into problems with that, where you've had a community that said, wait a minute, we had that exception in our governing documents. And lo and behold, you know, adult son of Mr. Jones is a real problem and we don't want him here, but now he owns the property and we, we couldn't do anything about it. So those are all things to consider, talk to your attorney about. You want to also consider when we're saying screened, if that includes, you know, occupants, not just sales, but leases, guests. What if someone is, again, an occupant? Are they a guest? If they're there for 30 days, does that now make them an occupant? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on the language in your governing documents. And that sort of runs into the whole issues. You know, a lot of issues we run into in South Florida with people where there's lease restrictions and all of a sudden somebody's not a tenant. They're, you know, a cousin who's visiting for six months. Do we get to screen that person at least? Maybe, depending on what the language is in your governing documents. Do you want that cousin to be able to come and stay if they have a, you know, again, terrible criminal history or, you know, whatever else it could be? You Maybe you want to be able to say no. You know, your cousin doesn't get to come and visit for six months at a time. You want to look at, too, often there's mortgagee protection clauses in your governing documents. Those were usually written by the developer to make it, you know, again, enticing for the, the lenders to, lo to loan in your community. So usually there are exceptions for them. So you might have an issue where something, a property gets foreclosed on, a lot or a unit, and the bank takes title. Odds are you're probably not going to be able to screen that. You're not going to be able to, you know, tell the bank they have to submit their financials to you before you, you know, give them a gate pass or whatever. Probably not going to fly. But again, that's going to depend on the language that's in your governing documents. Now, what if that bank wants to turn around and sell it. They're ready to, you know, they got a buyer lined up right away. Bank of America takes title. They're turning around selling it to investors or us tomorrow. Do you get to screen investors or us? Maybe, maybe not. Again, depending on the language in your governing documents. Usually there's an exception if someone buys at a foreclosure sale, which could be the lender, or it could be a third party. If investors or us just purchased the unit at the foreclosure sale directly, Again, depending on what language you have, you may or may not be able to screen them. And you may or may not be able to screen who they then want to rent to. So these are all important things that you want to look at. And that's language that has to be in your governing documents that you want to make sure actually syncs up with what you're doing in your community or what you want to be able to do in your community. Uh, like I said, there's sometimes there are some certain exceptions for parties, children, spouses, family members, things like that. Maybe you want to remove those or maybe you want to keep those in for various reasons. Usually we we see it on the other side when that exception is in there and a board doesn't want that exception in there. And now it's just too late. But another thing to keep in mind when we're talking about any screening or transfers, something that that relates to your governing documents. We have a question basically about uh, transfer fees. We get that a lot. In the world of HOAs, so for Chapter 720, there is no limit your transfer fee, you can charge an application fee, you can charge whatever you want to charge. You could charge a transfer fee in terms of some sort of capital, uh, you know, whatever it may be. But for condominiums, it's completely different. We're talking different ballgame. Chapter 718 has a restriction. Your transfer fee has to be no more than, and they did raise it, 150. So 150 an applicant, husband, wife, are considered one, uh, child dependent or parent dependent is considered one. Other than that, you can charge 150 for application, but that language too also has to be in your governing documents. So make sure you're you're following those 
restrictions because if you have something where you're charging $300 per application because, well, because the application background check costs 150 and we actually, then our management company charges us 150 and we don't want to come out of pocket for anything. So we're going to pay, we're going to charge them 300 bucks. If you're in the world of condominiums, be very careful because that is not what you're supposed to be doing and you might be on the wrong side of a, of a challenge. All right, this is the this is the hot topic. Okay, let me let me let me take a sip of my water here. All right, once the law changes, change is automatically applicable to your community. True or false? False. Okay. Now this is what we touched on earlier on. Generally, the law when the law changes, seven eighteen or seven twenty, it's going. First analysis is going to be whether it is a procedural change or a remedial change, or whether it is a substantive change that basically affects one of your fundamental contract rights. So, complicated, I know, and a lot of legal jargon and mumbo jumbo. But bottom line, if you are governing documents, let's say your declaration was recorded in 2000, whether we're talking condo or covenants, declaration, HOA, condo, doesn't matter right now recorded in the year 2000. Question becomes, are we subject to the statute from 718 or 720 from 2000? Or now that there've been changes, are we subject to 718 or 720? As of the 2024, July 1st, new changes, do we get to follow or do we have to follow those? So, Couple different ways to look at this. One is, do you have Kaufman language in your governing documents? That's the magic word you're going to hear. You're going to hear, you know, the magic words, Kaufman language. The actual language is as amended from time to time. So your governing documents may say, this this condominium or this HOA is subject to Chapter 718 or 720 as amended from time to time. If your governing documents say that, they have that magic phrase as amended from time to time. Basically, that means that you're following the statute as it's amended from time to time. So in, our, in that scenario, your declaration from 2000, if it has that language, you're following the statute and you're subject to the 2024 changes. If your governing documents do not have that language, arguably you are subject to the declaration as it was in the year 2000 or the statute as it was in the year 2000 when your declaration was recorded. Now, again, still conversations about if the statute changes as to procedural changes, those are going to apply to you no matter what. So again, the example, easiest one to give you is the condo election you know, change. Also, some changes now that they keep talking about changing the fining procedures in 720, 718, all of that. If those are just procedural, those are going to apply to you too. But if, it, if there's a fundamental substantive contract right that you had in your governing documents, and the one I'm going to tell you, and I know I'm opening Pandora's box here, the latest change in 720 had to do with commercial vehicles and allowing people to basically park their commercial vehicles or trucks in their driveways. That's the new language in, in the statute as of you know last month. And it says you can't enforce a covenant or restriction that, that prohibits that, essentially. So that's a hot topic. That's a question we've gotten from a lot of, of communities. Well, wait a minute. We do have a commercial vehicle restriction. We've always told people they can't park their commercial vehicles in the driveways. Why is this statute now coming in and basically changing everything for us? So that's a situation where if you don't have Kaufman language, if you are not subject to the statute as it changes, and you're in our scenario, you're only subject to you know the statute from the year 2000, other than those procedural changes, then there's an argument that those changes to the statute that are substantive cannot impair your contractual rights, your contract from the year 2000, and arguably then it's not that type of change is not going to apply to you. But again, this is a complicated legal argument. I don't want you to go back to your you know homeowners and say, great, we're telling everybody they still can't park commercial trucks in their driveways. Talk to your attorneys. That was one of the changes. I know that's one of the hot topics right now. I don't know why, but it is. So talk to your attorney because it's a, that's an, an important one. So Kaufman language, that's the important change. And there may be reasons you want Kaufman language in your governing documents, or perhaps in certain sections of your governing documents. 
it used to benefit you. Typically, the statutes would become, you know, more favorable to the associations. Maybe in the world of assessments, for example, or recovering after foreclosure, maybe that language could help you just in that section, just not overall. All things to consider if you're doing uh, amendments to your declaration. All right. Board must obtain a vote of the owners before making any material alterations, true or false. Again, false. You'll see a pattern here. So you, again, this is one of those things where you have to look at your governing documents first. Your governing documents might have language that say, you know, before you have a, uh, before the board can impose a, a special assessment for material alteration, it needs approval of whatever, two thirds of the owners or 75% of the owners. Now, there are all different variations of how that can go. In the world of condominiums, 718, Chapter 718 actually has language that says, if there's nothing in your governing documents, you need a 75% owner vote. You need 75% of your owners to approve a material alteration. Now, material alteration is, and the definition is a little wonky too, guys. It came from a, a case, but it basically means to palpably or perceptively change the appearance, the form, the function of the common elements. So if you are knocking down your, your clubhouse and putting in a new pickleball court, that's clearly going to be a material alteration to, to the common elements, to the common areas, whatever it may be. Common area language 720 is a little different. Usually there's no language in your, your governing documents, but you need to look at your governing documents to see if that's something the board can do without an owner vote or whether the owners need to get involved. Sometimes there's language that's it, it puts a financial uh, limitation on there. If you're doing a material alteration that's going to cost more than 10% of the budget, the owners need to vote and approve it. And maybe it does say two thirds or a majority or 75%. But the language can can sort of, uh, you know, covers a spectrum potentially. So look at your governing documents and see what the story is. If there's language in there that requires, again, a high threshold, maybe it does follow the statute and it says 75% of your owners. And maybe the board is thinking, well, we're going to do some projects we wanted to change some things. We're, we know we're going to need to get our owners to approve it. Maybe we should see if we can reduce that section or that voting threshold as well and you know, amend that section to something else. Again, maybe you put the financial threshold in there. Owners are only going to vote if it's something that costs more than 10% of the budget or owners are only going to vote if it costs more than $25,000. You can really sort of, again, be creative, talk to your attorneys to see what makes sense. If you know you're going to be doing a project, if you know you want to renovate your, your lobby and you're going to be, you know, moving things around, putting in new tile, putting in, you know, wallpaper, moving walls, whatever it is, see if you need a material alteration vote, talk to your attorney. Maybe you want to amend your governing documents to make it a little bit easier to get that vote. There is also an exception, keep in mind, for necessary maintenance items. And the case that you hear us talk about all the time has to do with a seawall. And essentially, in that case, board wasn't supposed to adopt a special unless they had uh, a special assessment, unless they had approval of whatever whatever the threshold was to do a material alteration. They had to repair a seawall, and there was a special assessment that came along with that. They didn't get the owner's vote. One of the owners challenged it. Luckily, the court came out you know, with the right uh, verdict there and basically said, wait a minute, this was a necessary maintenance item. We need your seawall to be repaired. We can't let your seawall just crumble into the, you know, into the water because owners don't want to pay another special assessment. That's crazy. Um, so luckily, if it is something that is a necessary maintenance item, if it is a necessary repair and you need those funds or you need to do that alteration for this necessary repair and don't be using this, this exception you know, freely. It really has to be a necessary repair. Talk to your experts, make sure you have an expert opinion to back you up on this. Then you don't need to get that membership vote. Because again, a lot of times your owners aren't gonna vote in favor because they know it's something that's gonna be expensive and they don't wanna spend the money. But if it's something that's necessary maintenance, that makes sense. You have to do it as a board. So you don't need to get that ownership vote. Um, in HOA world, again, it's a little different. The statute doesn't really address material alterations. Typically, it's written more in, in, in favor of letting the board make the decision without the members voting. Sometimes it's written as a capital improvement that costs more than X dollars, something like that. But again, look at your governing documents, maybe change that if you think you have something on the horizon. 
Delinquent assessments, accrue interest at the rate of 18% and a $25 late fee applies. Again, we write these to be a little tricky. False, because you need to look at your governing documents. The authority to charge a late fee has to be in your declaration or in your bylaws. If you want to be able to assess for it, it needs to be in your declaration. For condos, the interest needs to be, it can be in your declaration, but you're gonna be following the whatever's in your declaration. So if you have a rate that's lower than 18%, you're stuck with whatever that rate is. So if your interest rate in your, if you're in a condominium and your declaration says the interest at the rate of 9%, you're stuck with the 9% unless you modify this and amend it and put something, you know, change the wording to say at the highest rate allowable by law, then you can go up to the 18%. For HOAs, you can look at your declaration or bylaws. Same kind of thing though. You wanna make sure you have the language that gets you the most amount of money. And if there's nothing mentioned, you're, you're, the 18% is, is what you're using. All right. If there's a pipe in a wall, that only provides service to one unit, that unit owner is responsible for maintenance. Obviously, this is more of a condominium question. Sometimes true, sometimes false. Your maintenance requirements, this is another one that, that confuses people. Maintenance issues are completely outlined by your governing documents, completely. So if you want to change the maintenance requirements or you have questions about who maintains what, the statute does not tell you anything. So this is a great example. If you have something that only services one unit, maybe your documents don't really address that. Maybe they just talk about unit boundaries and common element and unit and association does common elements, owner does unit, and that's it. And that could be the case and that's great. That's how a lot of them are written. But if it is something that only provides service to one unit, perhaps you would rather it be that unit owner's maintenance responsibility and you could modify your documents to reflect that. And you could do it in a way where the association actually takes on the maintenance obligation in terms of performing those repairs, but then can charge it back to the owner. Maybe that's the best way to handle it, something like that. But again, that's all what's going to be in your governing documents. All right. Okay. I was trying to give us some time to get to questions. So good. So we, we got to our little summary here. So the big ticket items to take away here, safe harbor, mortgagee liability, old language in your governing documents might be sort of handcuffing you. So look at that. That might be something you want to change. Might as well. Owners are always in favor of it. It's getting the association more money. We like that. Why not? Um, same thing. Powers might be also limited by statute. So you want to look at what you in your governing documents, see if there's something you can, you can change there. You might be losing money, depending on what the language in your governing documents. Now, new laws, again, I said there were a lot of changes this session. 2024, we have a lot of new stuff going on. And this is a hot topic. Do those new changes apply to you? And the answer might be yes. The answer might be no. And that might depend on what the language is in your governing documents now. So that's important to be aware of. That's something you might want to look at. And then just the basic old language in your governing documents might expose you to a discrimination claim. You may not even realize it. There could just be old language that you've never enforced you never even noticed, and it just doesn't make sense anymore. So everyone's ignored it. But again, it could expose you to a possible discrimination claim. You might as well go through and make sure that language is just gone. Take that out. If you're a 55 and over, for example, you're a 55 and over community, and you know you might have old language that says no one under 16 can be here. That's not really what the laws say anymore. It's 18. So we wanna make sure those things make sense and, and sync up. All right, so let's look at the chat, see what, what questions we have here. Thanks, Emily. And uh, before you, while you're looking over those questions, I just wanna briefly go over, folks, we just placed the evaluation link into the chat area. The chat area is not the Q&A, it's not the same. The chat area is one way, the way we have it set up, we can send in information to you we just placed the evaluation link in there. So click on that and a new tab on your browser will open up to fill out the evaluation. And after you submit that evaluation, there is a area to check on whether you need a certificate or not. We're taking care of uploading the credit. You don't have to have a certificate, but if you need one, let us know by checking the box on the evaluation. And there's also on the submission screen after you submit it, 
There's also a link to download the slides. And I know that takes care of a few of you asking that question in the Q&A right now as well. So with that said, um, I'll go over this more slowly after Emily addresses a few of the questions, after Emily and Jason uh, uh, address a few of the questions. Back to you both. And Jason, you've probably gotten, have you gotten a lot of questions about this whole trucks and commercial vehicles change in the world of 720? There's a ton awesome. of them out there. And I, yeah. I think, you know, like you said, it's it's a delicate issue because, you know, there are people very passionate on both sides of it. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it you really do have to go in and look at that coffin stuff and, and go from there. Um, right. You know, we went through this a couple of years ago and they started saying we could have uh, first responder vehicles. People were passionate on yeah. both sides. Um, and it's Funny, we were just talking about that too, because in my mind, first responder vehicles have, you know, just always been allowed. But I forget mm -hmm. that at one point in time, that was a that was an issue too. Yeah, it absolutely um, was. So I was yeah. I was thinking a lot about what you were saying with the, you know, the bylaws and the screening and things like that. And when I'm thinking about it, and we're talking about it here, and I think it's good for our our, our viewers to think about, is. The governing documents are typically written by a developer who wants to sell the community as quickly as they can and get out of it. Yep. So the documents are not necessarily as controlling as a lot of us think they are, um, because they're really trying to get the units out the door, so to speak. Um, so as, a, as the end user, we really need to think about how we want it to, to run now that it, we're in control or that we've been in control for 20 years or whatever the case is um and really think about does the, do the are the teeth there that we think are there you know you talk about the late phase the screenings things like that um and and from the developer perspective they weren't important so now you really have to think about it from your user perspective and then take that to your documents right right that's really key because Guys, this whole thing started because a developer decided to build your community and to sell either the lots or the units. They were not in it for, you know, how is this going to look in 30 years? How, you know, how many cars are people going to have in 2024 as opposed to when I sold the condo in 1964? You know, it's it's just you got to remember there's there's a big gap in sort of how you started and where you are now. And you want to make sure your governing documents make sense now. You know, so someone asked here too, is there an amendment to the governing documents required for allowing electronic voting? Good question. No, you don't need to amend your governing documents. There is a procedure that you need to follow. So it's a special board meeting, 14 day notice, which is a little different as hopefully you guys all know, most board meeting notices are 48 hours. So 14 day notice, you have to have certain things in place. So talk to your attorneys about getting that lined up. You need to have your, your platform sort of ready certain notices need to go out to get everybody on board, but um, but it's not a complicated process. You can get that set up, you know, without an amendment. So that's really just a board, a board issue. Uh, let's see. What's the process for legal actions for owners who don't pay? It's not really about updating our governing documents, is it? Um, but basically that's a statutory, and good question in that, that is a statutory procedure, essentially. That's going to be a foreclosure process now they and they actually have changed that a couple times in the last couple of years used to be two notices and they were different timing depending condo or hoa now it's two notices they're 45 days each for condo or hoa but now we've added a new notice that has to come from the association or management before either of those two notices and that's your notice of late assessment that has to go out first to the owner to tell them hey you're behind here's what you owe you have 30 days to pay and you can't incur or include any attorney's fees in that notice. So once that goes out, now you have 30 days. Once that comes back and the owner still isn't paid, now you can proceed. You can send it over to your attorney. You can start incurring those fees that the owner is going to be responsible for. And then it's two statutory notices to record a claim of lien and then proceed to foreclose a claim of lien. And again, that's all by statute. And, and obviously your, your attorneys will have to handle that for you. And then we file a lawsuit and the whole thing. All right, let's see. Can the board have the power to sell houses that are illegal? Also a good question. Ultimately, yes, if it goes to foreclosure. Now let's be careful how we're saying this. If the unit or lot goes to foreclosure, so you've recorded a claim of lien, your governing documents and the statute both say that you have the right to have a claim of lien for assessments that are owed. 
whether that's 718 or 720, you have a claim of lien, you record it, then you foreclose it, your owner still hasn't paid, you go in into foreclosure, the whole litigation process, you get a judgment, you've served them, it's a lawsuit, they have the opportunity to respond, all of the things, you go through all the whole litigation process. Ultimately, your goal is to get is to get paid, but if they don't pay you, you're going to get a judgment of foreclosure. They're going to give you, the court's going to say that, you know, Mr. Jones owes you whatever it is, $10,000. That's going to include all the back assessments, interest, late fees, attorney's fees, costs, all of that stuff. And if that amount is not paid, the property is going to be sold on X date. So in theory, that property could be sold on X date. It could be sold to a third party. If no one bids over that judgment amount, then it may go back to the association. The association could potentially take title. And that's a whole new ball game. You could potentially, if the association takes title, maybe they want to rent the property and get their money back that way. Maybe they want to try and turn around and sell it. Important factors, there could be a mortgage on the property that could obviously affect the, the equity. So may it affect what you're doing. But lots of considerations when we're talking about foreclosure. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Can Kaufman language be removed by amendment of docs if it was put in? Interesting. That's a complicated question too. I think you can you can remove it, but then there's going to be an argument of when it was removed and when the time periods were and all of that. So again, the Kaufman issue now is it, it was sort of a I don't I don't know how to explain it. It was just sort of like a, a thought that some attorneys had of some it came up every now and again in the last couple of years. And now the last year or so now it is it is topic number one, hot, hot topic. None of the owners knew about it. And now, now it's discussed all the time. How often should the associations update their governing documents? You know, really, that's up to you guys. I have an association that that put in their language, in their, their declaration, they put language in there that they want a committee set up to review their governing documents every five years. Yeah. I, I didn't yeah. think that was a bad idea. Sure. You know. All right. Changing the clubhouse roof from asphalt to metal, is that going to be a material change? Yes, it is going to be a material alteration. But now whether or not you need a board vote, potentially, again, is going to depend on the language in your governing documents. If you have one of those provisions that says only if it costs more than X dollars and it doesn't cost more than X dollars, maybe it is only a board vote. Really just going to depend. So, All right. Cost of updating docs for a co-op. That's a good question. Co-op is, a, you know, again, a little different. Cost of updating documents, hard question to answer for you guys. If it's, you know, a couple amendments that you're doing that you already know you want done. Hey, we took this class. We already know these are some, some key points we've had issues with through the years. We want to update our assessment provision. We want to update whatever it is, our leasing provisions, blah, 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 blah. And you already know, and it's a handful of things. You know, we typically, we bill at an hourly rate. My rate's 300 an hour. Again, I'm one of the partners. I've been here for 12 years. I think that's very reasonable. Um, maybe only we're talking about only a couple hours of work. I don't know. If we're doing a whole new rewrite and we're going through your documents line by line and I'm giving you recommendations to each, you know, possible change, that's obviously a lot more time consuming. But ultimately, that may make more sense and that may be cheaper in the long run. So, it's entirely up to you. And that I would, that's a big project. So that really would depend on your, your governing documents, but I would ballpark that probably 10 to 12,000, something like that. Yeah. What a lovely note to end on. All right, guys. <laughs> it's one o'clock. I think we covered it all. Excellent job as always. And thanks for keeping it interesting as you always do, Emily. Thank you so much. And i um, going to go over the evaluation process one more time, but I know Jason and Emily have appointments to get to. So one last time, some parting words from each. Jason, I know you put it into the chat, but the chat moves. What is the best way to contact you? Uh, let everybody know. Um, best way to find us is just go to our website. It's prideinmiami.com. You can find any of us there. We're more than happy to help, even if it's just to have a conversation and talk things through the two. Thank you, sir. And thanks for having us today. We appreciate that. Thanks for reaching out. And Emily, the same for you. Uh, the best way, uh, it's right on your screen there, but uh, do you have a preference? It doesn't really matter. You can <laughs> uh, you can go through our website too. That that I will, I will promote us a little bit. There's a lot of helpful information on there, not just ability to reach me, 
right. we also have um, the legislative update that's on our website, which right. again, lots of changes this year. So maybe you want a nice, neat summary that that can help because there was a lot of information to digest. That's on our website, kbrlegal.com. Um, my email, everything's up there. You can you can find me pretty easily. Thank you.